Hello, I wanted to give a video update about what had transpired at the Southern Baptist Convention over this past week. Uh, as you remember, the church had sent myself and J.R. Haas as messengers to the convention to represent uh, Grace Family Baptist Church. They also sent my son, Houston Wright, to help us in uh, supporting the effort, and Houston was actually really helpful. Uh, we realized early on in the planning that uh, there were going to be many of the people inside at certain times, and we weren't going to have enough people outside. We only had two or three people outside, and we had close to 10,000 pieces of literature that we were trying to pass out uh, about the resolution that was being put forward. And, uh, you know, two and three people with so much literature was just a, a bit of a daunting task. So Houston came along. He did a great job uh, helping out in that effort. All of us uh, had much opportunity to... Uh, pass out the literature uh, by Free the States. They did a really good job on that, by the way. Excellent artwork, had a uh, full text layout of the resolution, also gave arguments for it, and uh, spent a little time in apologetics just kind of arguing against common uh, concerns that people would have with such a resolution. And what it did was it really uh, set the stage for people when the resolution was put forward on the floor to already have a strong understanding of what the resolution was and what it was not and why uh, it was important. Uh, it turned out that uh, the reason why it had to be brought this way, just so you understand how the Southern Baptist Convention works, anyone who is a messenger of the SBC can put forward a resolution to the Southern Baptist Convention, and there is a committee known as the Committee on Resolutions, and they get to determine which resolutions are going to be put forward on the floor of the Southern Baptist Convention and which ones will not be. Well, Bill Askell, the pastor from Oklahoma, and many other pastors had put together uh, this resolution on the abolition of abortion, and the committee did not uh, accept it. In fact, they turned it down, and they had turned it down two years ago as well, a different resolution. Um, however, you do have the opportunity, and it's difficult to do this. My understanding is this doesn't happen very often, or it doesn't happen. Uh, but Bill went to the floor, and he asked for the messengers to vote on bringing this particular resolution forward. That requires a two-third vote of all the people that are there. And uh, he got it. He got a two-thirds vote which meant that they had to put it on the order of business. The resolution had to be put forward and given the opportunity uh, for a vote. And so that's what happened on Tuesday, uh, which means that it was put on the schedule for business on Wednesday at 3.30. And uh, so we spent some time that evening and the next morning uh, just talking to people, passing out literature. They were very uh, willing to take the information, very willing to engage, very willing to have conversations about the resolution and what it meant and what it what it did not mean. Um, and so uh, after that work had been done, 3.30 the next day, uh, he ended up coming forward and brought the resolution forward, uh, had it read before all of the messengers. Uh, there's a series of debates that began to happen, and the debate is basically uh, someone coming up to the microphone, and you can say something either for or you can say something against it. And there's people that uh, came forward and began to give uh, different arguments. One person from the Ethics and Religious um, uh, Commission, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, ERLC, uh, made an argument. I think he was in front of me at the microphone. He began to make an argument that, you know, this was going to put us back and this was going to uh, destroy all of the work that had been done for. Uh, for so many years, uh, someone else began to argue that this was putting us back as well, and it needed to be uh, done away with. Others spoke for it. Uh, Brad Baggett, I remember, uh, gave a very strong argument for it. I'll go ahead and put some of this together in a, in an email. There's a few videos of this so you can see how, you know, kind of the convention works, how it operates. Um, it's, uh, in some ways... Uh, we don't do this at our church and have these kinds of business meetings. Uh, but if you've been a member of a church where you have many committees and the church business meeting is strictly Robert's rules of order, just imagine that with 15,000 people uh, from all over the country. And uh, that's, that's pretty much uh, what this was. Uh, someone ended up bringing forward an amendment, uh, which is interesting. So you can have a resolution you could have worked 
uh, for a year crafting it and working very precisely on your language and someone, you know, from Idaho can get up on a uh, microphone and change it. And if people vote for it, the resolution is is going to change. Uh, found that to be really interesting how that works. Uh, so someone ended up uh, making an amendment to this resolution. Uh, they added the word only um, prior to uh, the statement of um, incremental uh, incrementalism. And I'm not, I actually don't have it in front of me. So when I, when I send out an email, I'll be more descriptive on it. And so it, it it's, it's inconsistent with a lot of the other wording uh, that is in it. And some uh, may argue that it, it ruins the whole thing. Um, my opinion is that it doesn't. Um, let me keep going, though. I'll, I'll give an argument. I'll give my argument as to why I voted for it here in just a minute. Um, so that um, amendment ended up being made. And from there, uh, it, it went back to uh, to Bill, and Bill um, called, did what's called called the question, which means uh, called a vote for the uh, the resolution there as amended, and it passed overwhelmingly. And um, my opinion is, I think this is a win in many ways. This brought the idea of uh, abolition forward. Um, before a very large group of people, before, um, you know, um, who wants to vote against something like that? There's many that did, but overwhelmingly, it, it passed. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, it passed. And um, this is a win for a few reasons. Uh, the first one I would say is that it brought the conversation forward. Um before the largest uh, Protestant denomination. Uh, secondly, um, it's going to cause people to really think about it. Think about what this means. Think about what are the implications of uh, such a resolution. Um, you know, some, you could be a purist and say, you know what, it's not worded perfectly, and so this isn't a win at all. No, I don't think it was. It's not perfect. It got amended. But it's my opinion that it is very beneficial and the words in that resolution speak very clearly. You can there is a uh, newspaper in Tennessee that wrote on it, and they interpreted it as the Southern Baptist Convention um, put forward resolution that was the strictest uh, resolution that had been put forward in fifty years on abortion. And so it is understood if you read it in the basic sense of the words and what it says that it is saying that there is no allowance for abortion under any circumstance, for any reason, and without exception. So um, my opinion is that that it, that it makes it, uh, that it's a win. My opinion is that it was positive and that it's allowing this to be a conversation. Uh, because the problem is, is that, you know, so many times people are going in and they're having these debates. They're trying to argue legally over, you know, how wide the hall can be an abortion clinic and what kind of materials that you can make it out of and that's really not where we need to be arguing we really need to be making a stand and saying this is wrong and uh and this is murder so for those reasons i think that it was positive i think that it was good i appreciate the church uh sending us and the church praying for us and supporting us uh during this time this isn't like a win like yay it's done We've accomplished everything, not even close to that. It's just that the conversation was had before a very large group of people. The conversation is going to continue to be had. Um, this is just expanding that conversation. It's giving more opportunity to uh, be thinking through this and and talking about it. So from that perspective, I think it was a win, and uh, I really do appreciate uh, the opportunity to go. I appreciate uh, you know the support that Free the States gave. And publishing that material, and I appreciate all the people um, who who did this. And furthermore, I want to make a mention that you know the way this was implemented was was brilliant. Um, Bill Askell and the way he carried himself on the floor carried himself in a very likable way, um, in a very agreeable way. And uh, I think what was best for this is that the argument was really on the side of the abolitionist. 
Uh, there's a few other things that happened this week that were already going on in the convention that, in my opinion, really helped um, in this going through. Um, the first is that there was there was uh, a lot of distrust in the leadership of the SBC. Uh, there is some controversy coming out of the executive committee and some distrust in some of the leadership on the stage. I don't fully understand all of it. I began to try to find some information about the convention prior to going, but I didn't want to go through all the gossip blogs to try to learn everything. So I'm a little ignorant of all the controversies that are going on. But it was very evident that many messengers had a lot of distrust for the leadership that was up there at the time. And so when Bill Askell made the, made the argument that, you know, you stuff this, you refuse to put it on the floor, overwhelmingly there are pastors that want this to be there. I think that was a reason why we got the two-thirds vote that first day uh, very easily. That said, there's members of the um, leadership that began to go on social media and speak heavily against it, which is why I think there were less votes the next day. I don't think it was over two-thirds that voted for it, but it was still overwhelmingly passed. Two other things that I think helped in this uh, resolution going through. Uh, the second one is that there was a big emphasis on victims and uh, standing up for victims, standing up for the rights of victims, protecting victims. And when you begin to talk about, you know, biblically what you should do and how you should protect those uh, that are victims, there's no greater victims in this country right now uh, than those that are being murdered in the womb. There is no more dangerous place that you can be in this country than in the womb. We're destroying 3,000 babies each and every day. And so that very much worked in the favor of the argumentation of um, this resolution. And then a third thing that I think really helped out in this going through was the fact that um, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, what Southern Baptists hadn't done right before. There was arguments that, you know, we weren't right on slavery, and there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, social justice or how this should be done, and there's very, a lot of tension there. Um, CRD was condemned many times in this, but um, still I think the convention is still trying to work out how all of that should work itself out, but overwhelmingly there was agreement that the Southern Baptist Convention was wrong in their stance on slavery and was wrong in the victimization of people that were slaves and, you know, the families that that, was, that affected. And so this argument of Southern Baptists were wrong on slavery, okay, let's not be wrong on abortion. You were wrong on the abolition of slavery, let's not be wrong on the abolition of abortion. And I think for those three reasons, it really worked in a very positive way to help this to come forward and to get a positive vote. Other factors that were beneficial was it was just a really well-crafted plan. Um, the people that were involved understood how the convention worked. They understood how Robert's Rules of Order worked. They understood very well that people needed to be educated. And so there was planning ahead of time um, in a, you know, non-agitative way, in a non-abrasive way, in a way of just trying to, you know, I just want you to know this is the resolution. And, you know, if they say, you know what, I'm not interested in that, you smile at them and you just keep going to the next person and you tell them have a good day and you, you know, you just try to be charitable with people. And the group that I worked with did a great job of that. And they were not combative with people coming in. They were not disagreeable. They were not, you know, they, we would make an argument, but we weren't argumentative. And I think that really helped. It got to the point that... Um, by Tuesday evening, when we were passing out the literature, people were overwhelmingly saying, I have it, I agree with it, I'm going to vote for it. And others that didn't have it, they were like, oh, well, give me one. I want one. I don't have one. And uh, so there was a desire even of many people uh, to take it. Um, Bill handled himself on the floor excellently. He handled himself very likably. He did a good job of handling the crowd and, uh, you know, causing them to... Um, just, I think even people that disagreed with him probably liked him as a person. And, you know, I think there's something that, that we can learn from that. The, the way we communicate ideas sometimes is, you know, very important. Even if we say something that is, you know, theologically correct or technically correct or logically correct, if we're saying it in a way um, that is not appropriate for the setting, um, that it can really work against you. And uh, they did really well 
Um, furthermore, there was a good plan regarding um, having other microphones covered and having, uh, you know, people ready to give a defense for this bill. And uh, I ended up standing behind one of the microphones. Uh, I was behind the gentleman that was speaking for the uh, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, uh, making an argument that, you know, this was going to undo everything they had ever done. Um, so I didn't end up needing to speak because it was called to question before I had an opportunity. But we had people spread out, so they were ready to give a defense. Uh, I think for all these reasons that it just, it worked uh, really positively, and it worked in our favor, and it worked uh, just very beneficially. So I, I'm so grateful to uh, just have had an opportunity to take part in this, to uh, just have the, uh, just to be there, just to have the conversations with people, just to, you know, there wasn't a lot I had to do. I just had to step in and what can I do? I can pass this out. And, uh, you know, I, and that's, that's what I did. They already had a plan. And uh, I'm so grateful that our church was able to participate in this and to uh, to bring this forward. Um, one other thing that happened, which I had no intention of being involved in this, was um, that I would say shortly after the uh, resolution had passed uh, for the abolition of abortion, I was kind of hanging out in my seat and just relaxing. And um, it came to my attention via a text that I got that the new uh, Southern Baptist Convention president, Ed uh, Little, his his church website had a statement on it that was um, it was kind of heretical, actually, and it it had a statement that said the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are co-equal parts of God. Um, and we've been walking through Colossians chapter 1, so I hope most of you can recognize uh, what's wrong with such a statement. Um, I mean, if if Jesus is part God, then he's not God. He's only part of God. And if you're part of something, you're not, you're not that thing. Uh, and, you know, if you remember the uh, cartoon back in the 80s, uh, Voltron, where you had the uh, the different lions, and they'd all come together and make one lion robot. You know, well, none of them were Voltron the lion robot. They were just parts of it, and they had to all come together. So uh, if that's true, the Father's not God, the Son's not God, the Spirit's not God. Now, that said, I don't know why the website said this. I don't know if it was a mistake. I don't know if it was an error. Um, I do know that I was really alarmed when I saw it. I mean, if it had been something that I cared passionately about theologically, um, but maybe wasn't as significant as the doctrine of God, um, you know, borderlining on heresy here with partialism. Um, I would have stayed quiet. I wouldn't have said anything, but I became alarmed by this. Um, actually, probably just a little bit anxious, just really uncomfortable. I really felt like this needed to come to the floor, and, you know, the convention as a whole needed to know that the wording on this church's website needed to change. Like, this is unacceptable. You can't elect a president of the largest Protestant denomination and them have the very first paragraph of, you know, their statement of faith regarding the doctrine of God. And it's contradicting the definition of Chalcedon. It's contradicting the Baptist faith and message. It's contradicting the second, you know, London Baptist confession of faith and pretty much every other Orthodox Christian um, confession of faith it, historically, um, and so I went back and you know tried to see how can I bring this forward just so you know this can be known. And I was told business is over; you're not going to be able to bring that forward. Unfortunately, you can email the um, the credentials committee. Um, and I think in other circumstances, perhaps I might have taken that route, but I was really concerned that it was such an egregious error. Um, theologically, and I mean, I understand the consequences of, of getting the doctrine of God wrong, uh, getting, you know, and so what, for whatever reason, for whatever reason it was there, it needed to change, in my opinion, and it needed to come before the convention as a whole. I think it needed to be public, and so the strategy that I took um, is one that was, in all honesty, it was, it was disorderly. Um, and I normally wouldn't have participated or acted in this way, but what I did was, um, so the way it works is whenever any entity in the SBC, um, you know, um, gives their report, you're allowed to ask a question to that particular entity. And 
Um, the strategy that I took, and I came up with this idea in about 10 minutes, so I'd only known about this just a few minutes before I even spoke on it. Uh, I decided that after Al Mohler had given his report for Southern Seminary, that I would ask, ask him a question um, re regarding um, the theological instruction of future pastors, and I would use it as a segue to bring about this um, theological error on the church website that I had come across, and I thought that would be sufficient to at least get it out in the open, and I didn't want to do any back and forth. So I basically asked my question, and I went and sat down. I didn't want to bring any hype to this. I just wanted everyone to know that's what the church website said, so that there can be awareness of it, and so that hopefully... It'll change, at the very least. Um, and so I did. I had a chance to ask ask the question to Al Mohler. Uh, I will say this, that if you ever have an opportunity to speak in such a uh, convention, it is very distracting to speak. The reverb in that room, you are hearing the echo of your voice four and five times. And I had been warned that it was going to be difficult to speak Um and I, even with the warning, I wasn't ready for it. So it was, it really required you just to focus on what you're saying and not think about what you're hearing because you don't actually sound like what you're hearing. And uh, it's very confusing. But I just asked the question. I said, you know, I told Dr. Moeller, you know, I appreciate all that you've done and you've taught us for so many years that theology matters. Um, Dr. Moeller, I'm, I'm wondering if Southern Seminary teaches that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are part God, because when I go on the website of the new SBC President's Church, it says the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are part of God. Um, and Mueller was, you know, I, I think he was probably um, a little shocked that that question came forward. Um, I don't remember everything he said, but he said something to the effect of, you know, what they teach and also said that he, he's certain that the president would come forward and give a statement on, on this. And, um, he did, he got up right after me and went to a microphone. He was recognized and he, uh, praised Al Mohler, talked about how much he had appreciated him, how much great work he'd done for the SBC, loved all that he had done. Um, and then he, he left the room. I don't know why he didn't answer, um, perhaps he was taken off guard. Um, really, if there had been more time, I think I would have handled this differently, but I saw it when I did, and I really felt that I just needed to, to at least put it on the floor and, and, and to say something. Um, I'm a little disappointed that the, the president didn't at least say something, say, I, I don't believe that the father, son, and Holy spirit are part of God. Um, and the reason why he didn't do that, I, I don't really know. I do know that that changed uh, when I had gone to lunch. Um, that had actually changed. So now, you know, actually, now that I say this, um, you know, I don't know. I may have my time wrong during the day. So, but I remember there was a time when it was it was it was during lunch on Wednesday when this happened. So this may have this was actually. So I've told you the times go to wrong. This happened. This happened before the um, the uh, the resolution for the abolition of abortion was brought to the floor. So actually, they were outside uh, praying and planning, and I had decided to stay inside so that I could uh, say this whenever Al Mohler came up. So um, it was during lunchtime. So when I was eating lunch, uh, someone had texted me and told me, "Hey, they've they've changed their doctrinal statement." Um, I don't know how that works. I do know that I do not have the ability over lunch, and we are <laughs> we're an elder ruled church. I don't have the ability, even with my co elder, uh, just to come together and change the doctrinal stance of my church. So I don't know if this was the doctrinal stance of the church, or if someone just accidentally put it up there incorrectly, but usually with a doctrinal stance, I mean, that's already been voted in. That's something that is constituted within the church. I don't know from a polity standpoint, I don't understand how that changes uh, during lunch, but I don't know how they're structured. Maybe, maybe they can do those things in that time period. Maybe it was just an accident. Um, to this point, as far as I know, he hasn't said anything. I really don't Honestly, I don't know a lot about him. Uh, I know very little about him. Actually, I don't know much about any of the people that are running for president except for 
except for Al Mohler. And um, my concern really just was with uh, those, those particular words. So um, no, that's the last piece of business I wanted to tell you about. Um, and that was something that just happened happened on the fly. Um, do appreciate the opportunity to uh, to go and to participate, and I appreciate the church sending us. And um, I'll send out an email shortly, just giving some some links to some of these videos, so that you can uh, you know kind of see how how the convention worked, and uh, you can see um, you know some of the different arguments uh, that people were giving uh, for the resolution. So uh, thank you, and have a good day.